also be. Yeah. Yeah. And so when Ukusa was sharing about how we are to be aggressive in the last days about investing in the kingdom of God, oh God. it really struck a chord because the scripture that he was also quoting from Matthew 6 is one that I will touch on quite a lot in my message. Amen. 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 So just a bit of a disclaimer to start, Pastor the message that I'm going to share this morning is one that is a call, it's a clarion call to believers. It's a call to action, Pazalwan. It is not a message that is meant to instill fear or panic in anyone. Amen? In fact, to the contrary, it is a message that is to reinforce and to reassure us that God is still seated on the throne and that He's still in control of everything. Amen? So, beloved, the world that we are living in is changing at a very, very fast pace. And the church has to keep up or else we will be just as surprised as the world which gets taken by surprise when these things happen. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. We know that in the book of Amos chapter 3 verse 7, the word of God says that surely the sovereign Lord does nothing yeah. without revealing his plans to his servants, the prophets. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Now, we know that the one world agenda is at the top yeah. of every government meeting in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. However, the Bible presents us with very, very useful financial principles which have eternal rewards. Amen? Hallelujah. It contains and reveals financial secrets that the world does not know. Amen? Hallelujah. It encourages us to reevaluate our priorities and to seek the eternal rather than the earthly. Amen? Amen. Now, Bazalwani, if the media team can assist me, I would like to share some pictures and some news articles because I think right now we are living in a time where everywhere you look in the news and in the media, the media is telling us about COVID-19 and about vaccinations. And then maybe the news presenter will then say, and in other news, these are the other news, Bazalwani. And these other news are very important for us. And I will explain as we go along. Amen? So, this is an article from last year. It says, the coronavirus pandemic will cause famine of biblical proportions. I don't know if you can read the, the, the bottom part. It says, governments must act now to stop 265 million starving. Was World Food Program boss. This is from the secular world. They are talking about a famine that is coming of biblical proportions. We know that the word of God tells us that these things will happen. Yeah. Yeah. So what does that tell us as believers? When we read articles like this, what must we think of? The first thing that comes to my mind is food security. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Amen? If you can move to the next one, please. Can you move to the next one? It's quite interesting, beloved. You know, we, we think that these things are far-fetched or they're going to only happen in the far distant future. But Bazalwane, the time is short. Amen. The purpose of this message is to tell us that we have a window period that God has provided to yes. us. Yes. And we have to act fast. Amen. 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 So, this is a book that was written by a gentleman called Klaus Schwab, who is the founder and chairman of the World Economic Forum. It was, it was released in June last year, at the height of COVID-19. Yeah. You can see the title of the book. But here's the thing that caught my eye. When they met last year, the World Economic Forum said this, by the year 2030, all products will become services. You will own nothing and you will be happy. No. You will not own a car, you will not own a house, you will not own any appliances or any clothes. Shopping will be a distant memory in the city of 2030. Sure. These people are telling us what is coming. Yeah. They are telling us that this is their plan. Yeah. So what we need to do is to try and get out of the current system, which is crumbling, and I'll go through some of the examples now. 
The current Babylonian system that we are part of is collapsing, yeah. Mazarwan. Hallelujah. We cannot invest all of our resources in the Babylonian system. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. As a matter of fact, we should put all of our eggs in one basket, which is the kingdom of God. Yeah. Yeah. Financial yeah. advisors will tell you, you must yeah. diversify. Yeah. Diversify. Yeah. In the kingdom of God, we put all our eggs in the one basket, which yeah. is the kingdom. Yeah. Amen. Amen. If you can move to the next one, please. So, uh, next one. Uh, one more. Right. This is something that I didn't know about until I started preparing the message. The Chinese economy is on the verge of collapse. Amen. Yes. Yes. There's a company called Evergrande, which is a, a, a property company in China. So, so that company is the world's most indebted company. They say it is it owes about 300 billion US dollars. Why is this important for us sitting here in South Africa? For those who were at the Marketplace Forum workshop on the 9th of December, you will recall that one of our guest speakers said this. He said in South Africa, 65% of what we consume, whether it is shirts, shoes, microphones, you name it, comes from China. Yeah. So if the Chinese economy collapses, it means we will have to find alternative sources to provide us with these items at a much higher price. Yeah. Because China, that's why we go to China, it's cheaper. Yeah. What does that mean? It means that we'll, we'll be more indebted yeah. as South Africans. Yeah. We know that the Antichrist government that is coming will be underpinned by what? The over-indebted people. Yeah. Because you will not have a choice. Mm. You will be over-indebted to the system. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, if the Chinese economy collapses and we become more indebted, we become controlled. Yes. Revelations 13. Yeah. 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 We will not be able to buy or sell unless we take the mark. Yeah. But we know the Lord provides for us as a life. He always protects his own. Yeah. We know what happened in Egypt. Yes. In the land of Goshen. Amen. Hallelujah. That's the Lord. Can you go one down, please? Now, here's what I was talking about. Bill Gates, early this year, became the largest individual owner of farmland in the U.S. Mm. He's got more farmland in the U.S. than any other person. Mm. This is a gentleman whose primary investments are in the IT space and pharmaceuticals now with vaccines. But he's acquiring farmland at a rapid pace. What does that tell us? Think about it. Under the Antichrist government, what is going to be one of the most crucial ways to control people? Food. 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 Amen. Yeah. 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 So as believers, we can see what is happening. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to move with at a very swift pace to become as independent as possible from this current current system that yes. is collapsing. Amen. 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 One more up. Okay, I don't know if you can see that. Um, that is a one hundred trillion dollar uh, from the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe. Now, there's something called hyperinflation. Those who did economics will tell you. Uh, hyperinflation is when inflation rate is 50% or more every month. Uh, when I did my undergrad degree, we had a professor uh, who, uh, she was the advisor to the Minister of, of Finance uh, at that stage, I think it was Trevor Manuel and, and the, the Reserve Bank Governor was putting it over And when we used to get to the part on hyperinflation, she used to say, don't bother reading this chapter, it will probably never happen in your lifetime. And then, needless to say, four years later, it happened in Zim. Why am I saying this, beloved? Because as believers, when we look at the book of Revelation, it is that chapter on hyperinflation yeah. that we skip. Because we think it won't happen in our lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. It is happening, beloved. Yeah. One more back. Now, I don't know if you can see that as well. Our brothers and sisters from Zim may be able to bend me out here. There came a time when there was hyper, so much hyperinflation in Zim that you had to pay 100 billion Zim dollars to buy three eggs. Yes. Oh my God. Oh my God. 
Needless to say, if you have your own chickens at home in your yard, you don't have to pay a hundred billion. Yes. If you have a farm with chickens, yes. you don't have to pay a hundred billion yes. to buy three eggs. Yeah. Okay. Let's look at what the word says. If we can go to the book of Revelation, chapter 6, verse 6. If you can take from the NIV, Pastor Ayanda. Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, Two pounds of wheat for a day's wages, and six pounds of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. Amen. In fact, I will also read from the NLT version, Revelation chapter 6, verse 6. And I heard a voice from among the four living beings saying, A loaf of wheat bread or three loaves of barley will cost you a day's pay. And don't waste the oil and the wine. Beloved, to summarize, this is saying there will come a time when you work a full day just to buy a loaf of bread. I know of households that eat three or four loaves of bread in a day, which means there will come a time when some of us will have to work four times as hard just to afford one loaf or one day's uh, uh, supply of bread. So when we talk about hyperinflation and what is happening now, it is not something that is in the far or distant future. I was just looking at the petrol price and I saw that five years ago, we were paying 11 rand and some change for petrol. We're now paying 20 rand. We've almost doubled the petrol price in five years. Yeah. Uh, sure. There's an interesting uh, scenario that happened in, 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 in Germany after the Second World War, when Germany was defeated. They used a currency called the Reichmark. Now the Reichmark, it got to the point where they were so indebted after being defeated in the war that they had to cancel that, that currency. And they then introduced the date mark, which is what they're using now. And when they did that, everybody was given 40 Deutsche Mark to start off with. In other words, they became so indebted, they said, forget this currency, we're starting afresh. And everyone is gonna get 40 Deutsche Mark to start. It, that, it didn't matter if you had one million Reich Mark or nothing in your account. It was all wiped out, and you started off with 40 Deutschmark. Why am I saying this? Because fiat currency, beloved, is, is not backed up by anything. Yeah. Yeah. The money that you have in your pocket is not backed up by anything. It's, yeah. it's a note that is printed. Yeah. 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 You saw 100 trillion, 100 billion. So what happens when currencies collapse like that because of national debt being so high is that we have a scenario whereby you start thinking to yourself, if I put a thousand rand in the bank, how safe is it? So, yeah. There's something called fractional banking, beloved, which is basically the rules that the banks have to play by. If you take a thousand rand and you put it in the bank, the bank cannot take all of that amount and give it to Pastor Mpache. The bank has to keep a percentage of that, right? With COVID, in America, all the banks that have assets of less than 16.3 million are no longer required to keep any of the money. There's no reserve. In other words, if you put $1,000 in, in a bank account, if you come tomorrow, and they say they don't have it, it means they don't have it. Before COVID, they had to keep, it was a 90-10, they had to keep 10%, 90% they could take and give it to Pastor Pachet. And then Pastor Pachet had to pay it back to the bank with interest. Now they don't have to do that. They can take all of that money and borrow it. Now what's happened with COVID, people have lost their jobs. Economies have gone down. So there's a lot of people who can't pay back. In other words, the fiat currency is not stable. Yeah. We cannot keep our money in the bank. Mm. Mm. Beloved, I spoke about the movements that are afoot to try and create this one world government and how urgent it is. In America, there is 
a currency, there's discussions around a currency that will be called the Amero, similar to the Euro, where North and South America will have one currency. So the consolidation of currencies is part of that agenda, to have one world order. We saw Pope Francis talking about one world religion. As a matter of fact, yesterday I was, uh, I was at uh, Virgin Active and I was um, just meditating on the message today and uh, another gentleman from uh, Overport came to sit next to me and I, I didn't know this gentleman. And we started talking and he said, what do you do? And I told him, and then he said to me, do you realize that this whole thing, everything that's happening is to usher in the Antichrist? And it turns out that this gentleman is a pastor in Overport. And he says to me, did you see this video? And he sent it to me of one of the British royal families recently when he was presenting a speech at the United Nations. He said something very strange. He was talking about how we can now get out of this, this national crisis and global crisis. And he was saying nations must work together and they must not work in parallel. They must combine their efforts. But even the nations of the world do not have the trillions of dollars that are at his disposal. His disposal. Who is he referring to? The pastor said to me, is it possible that these people are already engaging with the Antichrist? We know that the Antichrist is alive somewhere in the world already. When he said he has trillions of dollars at his disposal, more than all the nations combined, I had to listen to it three times. I even got my wife to listen to it because I thought maybe I'm going crazy. That is how close we are, beloved. Yeah. 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 I don't know, some of you may recall five years ago when uh, Barack Obama was the president of America, there was a, a whole scandal because $1.7 billion was flown to Iran overnight. Cash, 1.7 billion US dollars cash in two Boeing A737 uh, uh, aeroplanes. So the question was, why don't you just EFT the money? Because the US owed the money to Iran. It was known that the debt was there for 60 years or whatever it is. So beloved, these other news that I'm telling you about is just the background and the backdrop of why it is that the prophetic messages that we keep receiving about how close we are to the coming of the Lord are real. Amen. They are so imminent. Amen. Oh, yes. Amen. Amen. So God's word leads us to making investments that will pay off in the long run. Hallelujah. As I said, it has eternal rewards. Amen. 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 Now, regardless of whether you have a lot or you have little, there are three principles that I want you to take home today that will help us to rejoice in the Lord, even during financial crisis. Amen. Amen. You know, my wife was actually telling me a story. She was listening to one of the pastors in America who was saying, in his offering basket, sometimes he finds buttons. Because somebody was so moved by the message, they wanted to give, but they had nothing except the button on their coat. So they cut the button and they put it in the offering basket. So he was saying that he actually prays over those buttons. And he says, Lord, bless this person. Because the heart wants to give. Amen. Amen. So the first principle, Bazaran, is we need to accept the eternal truth that God is the owner and creator of everything. And we are just stewards. Amen. You know, uh, uh, when I read that quote from, from the World Economic Forum where it says you will own nothing and you will be happy by 2030, it annoyed me initially. I thought, who is this guy? What does he think? You, you know, who does he take us for? But then I remembered that we own nothing anyway. Yeah. Yeah. We are merely stewards. Yeah. Everything belongs to God. Yeah. As a believer, all of the resources and the blessing that we get, that we receive, belong to God. Amen? Yeah. Which is why even when we are to tithe, the 10% that we tithe, we are left with 90%. It doesn't mean that the other 90% we can do whatever we want with it. Yes. Yes. Amen? Yes. Amen? 
everything we have is a gift of grace from God. Amen. 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 Praise God. Now, what does it mean to say that we are stewards? It's a, it's a nice word, but what does it practically mean? Now, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, it says, Now it is required that those who have been given trust must prove faithful. I want you to underline the word faithful. Amen? Amen. So we see in scripture that it is a requirement. It is mandatory. There's that word again. Yeah. For us to be faithful. Yeah. Amen. Amen. It is not a nice to have. Yeah. It is not optional. Yeah. We have to be faithful. Yeah. Amen. Amen. These are the words that we all want to hear when we are finished running our race here on earth. Well done, yeah. my good and faithful servant. Hallelujah. Amen. So as a steward, what are we supposed to do? A steward is someone who, ma who manages another person's property, finances, or other affairs. Amen. Amen. So the question I always ask myself is, after my death, if somebody was to write a biography about me, and they took my financial records, they took my bank statement, my policies, my investments, what would that biography say about my belief in Christ? What would it say about my investments? I spoke earlier about Luke 12, uh, chapter 34, about where your treasures are, your heart lies. What would it tell about my heart? Because that biography will effectively be a reflection of what my heart was like yes. while I was still alive. Yes. Amen. Amen. So the way we handle our money reveals the depth of our commitment to Christ. That's why Christ spoke so much about money. As a matter of fact, some biblical scholars will tell you that one sixth of the Gospels and one in every three parables spoke about stewardship. Jesus dealt with money matters because money does matter. Yeah. The problem is, to some of us, it matters too much. Yeah. 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 Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, yeah. and all these other things shall be added unto you. Yes. Amen. 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 Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. And God shall supply all your needs. Notice, it doesn't say all your desires. Yes. It says all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Yes. The one thing I love about God is when it says according to his riches in glory, his riches are eternal. They are never ending. It's a bottomless pit. It's not like nations. You know, when the, when the minister of finance stands before the nation and says, this is the budget speech. We have 800 billion or 1 trillion to spend. God doesn't have a budget. So when God says he will supply your needs according to his riches in glory, they are eternal. They are never ending. There are no needs that will ever be too much for God. It doesn't matter how much you need, how much indebted you are. If God wants to provide for that, he will provide. Amen. The second financial principle, beloved, is that Christ who created and redeemed us will meet all of our needs. In the book of 2 Peter, chapter 5, verse 9, we see that Peter speaks about how God did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood. He protected Noah and seven others. And then he speaks about how God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, but he rescued Lot and his daughters. And in verse 9, Peter then says, if this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and to hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment while continuing their punishment. Amen. So God will protect us, beloved. You know, I spoke about Goshen earlier. It didn't start with the plagues in Egypt. It started during the, the time of drought, which was the in history probably one of the biggest famines that hit the Middle East in the times of Jacob. But the Lord provided because Joseph was able to prepare a place for 
his brothers and his family members in Goshen. Mm -hmm. yes. Amen. 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 So in many ways, it's a reflection of what is happening now. We are living in times of darkness, but God has sent his deliverance for us. Oh, yes. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. So Goshen was a place of refuge for God's people. It was separated during the fourth plague. There was no hail in Goshen when the rest of Egypt was suffering from hail. When there was darkness in the rest of Egypt, there was light in Goshen. Amen. Amen. The firstborn of Israel were saved when there was death all over Egypt of the firstborn. Amen. Amen. And God can do it again. Yes. yes. That's the Lord. God will provide your Goshen and my Goshen even in these times. Yes. Amen. Amen. Because God knows what is going to happen. He knows about the calamity and the chaos and the confusion because of man's wickedness. But he will never allow for his work to be hindered. Yes. Amen. 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 Now, you see, the financial system that we have here on earth tries to get us into unnecessary debt. Yeah. I said earlier, it's all about control. Now, I was watching a video from one of the uh, pastors who does, he lectures one of the modules in our Bible school uh, here at CCMC on Kingdom Finances. And he was saying that they did a study of uh, modern uh, civilizations. And there are two things that they picked up as trends. When a modern civilization is about to come to an end and a new one is about to come in. Now you can't put in a new system unless you collapse the old one. Yeah, yeah. He said these two things take place. There is a rampant increase in homosexuality. Yeah. Yes. The second one is that society moves very closely to being a cashless society. Because remember, if you control the cash, you can control people. Yeah. China is already piloting a digital currency. Yeah. What happens when that comes to pass? If you say something that the government doesn't like, they freeze your account. Yes, 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 yes. Right now, this watch that I'm wearing, and there are many others, it allows me to go without cash, without a card, a bank card, and buy groceries, fill up my car at, at the petrol station. The technology is here already. Yes. Yes. In Sweden, they are already implanting microchips in people. Yeah. That is the next step. Yeah. So when you hear about digital currency and doing away with cash, you must always think, why? Yeah. Yeah. It is because once you centralize control of the money, the cash, Revelations 13, yes. people will not be able to buy or sell mm -hmm. unless they take the mark of the beast. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So. We need to understand, beloved, that this system that we are in is geared around getting people to be over-indebted. Yes. Yes. In the last days, one of the things that we as believers will be hated for is because we will be seen to be blessed and favored by God. Amen. Amen. Make no mistake, beloved, the world may be unsaved, but they are not stupid. Yeah. They can see when somebody has a divine blessing on their lives. Yeah. And they will be asking, what is it about these Christians? Yeah. Everybody is crying, they are losing their jobs, but they are getting promoted. Yeah. People, people don't have food security and these people are buying land. Yeah. What is it with these Christians? Yeah. That's the law. And that is to provoke the jealousy of the world so that it stirs them up to say, Amen. the only place where we are safe yes. is under the shadow of his mighty way. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. This is exactly what God wants. He wants us to be divinely successful, not only for our own materialistic lifestyle, but to be a blessing unto others. Yes. As we stretch out our hands to the community, to our neighbors, to our friends, and we bless them, we will be blessed. You see, the way I see it, if I am not faithful to the kingdom of God, God blesses me. The little that I get, 
I'm not faithful. I take my money or resources and I invest them outside of the kingdom. If I lose my job or my source of income, at worst, the kingdom of God is in a neutral position. Because I wasn't contributing to the kingdom. I wasn't advancing the kingdom anyway. But if I am a faithful vessel, it's in God's interest and the kingdom's interest for God to make sure he restores that faithful vessel. Amen. Amen. These are kingdom principles, beloved. I know that in the world, it is about gathering as much as we can and storing up. But what does Malachi 3, verse 9 to 12 say? Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. That there may be food in my house. Amen. Test me on this. Amen. 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 I've tested God on this and Amen. he's got a hundred percent record. Amen. 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 And he says, he continues, says the, the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven yeah. 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 and pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room to store it. Amen. 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 So, when we look at the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 14 to 30, this passage of scripture talks about the talents. Essentially, it's a parable about the investment of talents. Amen? Amen. Amen. In our present day understanding, a talent is a natural ability. But in Jesus' time, a talent was actually a measurement of gold or silver. In fact, in the NIV, it calls it a bag of money, equivalent to about 6,000 denarii, or about what a common laborer would make over the course of 20 years. So we're talking about serious money here. So Jesus tells this parable about investing, and the primary lesson that we are to receive from it is this. Take what you have and invest it in God's kingdom. Trust God to win the return. Amen. 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 The Bible tells us that everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Right. I've just shown you what's happening in China. I actually didn't even mention Turkey. For those who can go to the internet, Google Turkish currency crisis right now. The Turkish lira is in crisis. So there are all these things that are happening, beloved. But for us, for as long as we invest in the kingdom of God, we know that our account in heaven is safe. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So, how do we get there? How do we invest all that we have for God's purposes? Here are three ideas. They are not exhaustive. There may be more. But these are the three ideas that I would like to share with you this morning. Firstly, do not compare. Do not compare what Mount Tepe has received and what I have received. Yeah. Yeah. The first thing I notice in the parable is that each servant got a different amount. Mm. Yeah. The one servant got five talents, yeah. Yeah. the second one got two, yeah. and the third one got one. Yeah. Verse 15 tells us that the master assigned these amounts according to each one's ability. Mm. Amen? You know, if I was the guy who received the two talents, I would have easily been jealous of the guy with the five talents. Yeah. And if I was the guy with the one talent, I would have been easily jealous of the other two. Yeah. But, beloved, I want us to be encouraged here. Because the truth of the matter is that some people get more than others. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some have bigger cars, bigger homes, better clothes. Yeah. Uh, they can sing better. They are more gifted. Uh, you know, so we must not open ourselves to the problem of jealousy. Amen. 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 You see, God gives us ability according to our abilities. He gives us, sorry, He gives us blessings according to our abilities. Amen. To God, size, the size of the gift doesn't matter. In fact, I read a story recently about a guy uh, who's passed on now. His name was uh, Antonio uh, Stradivarius. So Antonio, as a young man, wanted to sing very badly. He wanted to join this boy's choir. So he went to the auditions and they chased him away because, uh, you know, they, they can see you don't have talent, 
You know, they said he, his voice was too high pitched and squeaky. So they chased him away. They said he can't sing. So he went home and he asked his parents if he could try playing the violin. So they bought him a violin and he started practicing at home and then the neighbors came to knock on the door and they said to his parents, please tell him to stop. So the only talent he had was crafting. He was able to craft sculptures. So when he grew up, he became an apprentice to someone who made violins. By the time Antonio died, he left behind 1,500 violins that he had made. They sell at $100,000 a piece. After his death, somebody bought one for $16 million. Here's the thing, beloved. He used the one talent he had. Those violins are producing music, beautiful music till this day. He didn't know how to sing. He didn't know how to play the violin. He didn't know how to preach or to teach. But he had one talent. Use that talent. Whatever it is, it may be your kind heart your personality yeah. to win souls for the kingdom. Yes. It may be extra possessions, whether it's extra food that you have in your house that you can share with those in need, or extra clothing. Use what you have. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Notice again in the parable where the money came from. It all belongs to the master. When you realize that everything that you have is a gift from God, you really use it very, very sparingly. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, I, I, I think one of the things that our guest speaker said at the Marketplace Forum was, even when you put money in a money market or one of these uh, investment uh, products, ask them for the sheet. There's a sheet that tells you where that fund invests its money. You know, people in the Muslim faith, they will ask for those things. They will say to the bank, okay, this is the money, but tell me. And then they will look and they will see an alcohol company and they will say, no, I'm not going to put my money there. Mm-hmm. So that is the level of detail we need to get to. Yeah. Where yeah. even indirectly, if our money is going into some area that is uh, not for the kingdom of God, we need to be careful. We, yeah. need, to, we need to stay away from that. Amen? Yeah. 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 Now, since we are going to invest, um, we need to invest in obviously things that count. Now, I mentioned the issue of fiat currency, and I mentioned the issue that it's unstable. So the question is, if it belongs to the master, how do I know what the master, in our case, the Lord Jesus, how do I know where the Lord wants me to invest the resources that he's blessed me with? That, that's the third principle. You must know the master's heart. You see, the problem with the third servant who had one talent is that he just didn't know his master. You see, fear crept into him. Instead of investing that one talent, he decided to bury it. Because he didn't want to lose it. So, kingdom principle is if God blesses you, you multiply. Yeah. Amen. 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 So when his master came back, what did the, the third servant say? He tried to blame it on the master. He says, I know that you are a hard man. So in order to not lose this talent, I decided to bury it. Mm. And he dug it up and he said, here it is. Yeah. But the response from the master is very interesting. In fact, it sent chills down my spine every time I read it. Then the master said, at least you could have invested the money in the bank and made a little interest. He then refers to him as a wicked and lazy servant. And he said, throw him out where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the Gospel of Matthew here expresses a description of hell. Yeah. Which is which is it's really quite scary because I found that he didn't lose anything. Yeah. Yeah. So he yeah. simply preserved what he was given. Yeah. But when the master came back, he was so unhappy with him, he said, 
throw him out. Yeah. This wicked and lazy servant. Because what he did was not biblical. He did not multiply what was given to him. Amen. So fear can resist us or restrict us. And that may lead to destruction. I mentioned inflation, and I'm not going to go into it. So what we have to do, Bazarwane, is to always seek the Lord, to say, Lord, the little that you've given me, how do I multiply this? Where must I invest it? Where must I put it? So that it will multiply to, first of all, sustain what you need me to do. But not only that, it must also multiply so that it helps others to yeah. further the kingdom. Yeah. Amen. So, some of us here may, may say we are not really worried about investments, we are not in a position to invest. So we may feel that we don't really have anything to invest now, so what difference does it make? But you see, you need to actually pay attention to the lesson that we, the lesson that we get from the scriptures, because you may actually be in a position to invest more than you think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, God assures us that our lives are reciprocal. Amen? Amen. That is what the third servant fails to understand. He received, and then he did nothing. There was no reciprocal rewards or, or returns. So when we get blessings, and we are thinking about where to invest them, Especially at this time, Lazarus. Yeah. I cannot tell you how many times my wife and I will sit and we'll discuss this and we'll say, okay, let's pray about what do we do now, what do we do next. And the, the, the decision and the enemy is very cunning, Lazarus. There will always be a personal need that will come. Yeah. Yeah. The minute God blesses you, He will create another need yeah. that appears to be very urgent. Yeah. 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 So that you... you Whilst you are praying on the one hand to say, Lord, give me wisdom. How do I invest this or how do I multiply this? He will come with something yeah. that will try to distract us. Yeah. Yeah. We know that in the book of Luke, chapter 6, verse 38, give and it will be given unto you. Oh, yes. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, yeah. and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, you will be, it will be measured unto you. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. The emphasis here is not the quantity. It says give good measure. Mm. It doesn't say give a lot. Mm. Amen. Yeah. It's a question of the heart. Mm. Yeah. Whatever you give, it depends on what the posture of your heart is. Mm. Hallelujah. Yeah. So the economics of investing in God's kingdom is very funny because it works or it is governed by the mathematics of the supernatural. Yes. Yes. It is not based on how much you have in your account. It is always God supernaturally multiplying the little that you have into a lot. Amen. So how do we make good financial investments? Well, we, we need to firstly differentiate. When we invest in the kingdom of God, there's no credit score. If you have a good credit score or a bad credit score or no credit score, God doesn't have those requirements. We simply seek the Lord. Once we get direction, we do it by faith. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. So making wise investments in God's kingdom doesn't have anything to do with how much you have to invest. But it is everything to do with how you manage and handle the little property that you are given. Yeah, yeah. That is the essence of stewardship. Amen. Amen. So the more responsible you are with the little you have, the more God will multiply it. We must also learn to be content, Bazaar. You know, we take things for granted like food, shelter, and clothing. Two-thirds of the world don't have those things. And we forget that. Amen? So, we must 
First things first, we must take care of the essentials. And then we need to seek the Lord on what we are to do with the rest. Amen. 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 Let no debt remain outstanding. I like this one. In other words, you should pay for your bills. Give everyone what you owe to them. Pay your taxes, if you owe taxes. If you owe respect, pay respect. If it's honor, then it's honor. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. Romans chapter 13, verses 7 to 8. And similarly, we each need to ask ourselves, what does the way I spend my money say about what I believe about heaven and eternity? You see, it's quite difficult, Bazalani, for us here on earth to conceptualize what our heavenly bank account looks like. Here on earth, you can just go into your phone or ask for a statement and you can see what your bank balance is. Your heavenly bank balance is an unknown. We, 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 we invest in the kingdom by faith. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So, the investments of this world are perishable. I've mentioned how the systems are collapsing and there are great shakings that are happening. So, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust yeah. destroy and where thieves break in to steal. Yeah. So the phrase here is store up for yourselves, which comes from the word treasure box. So what Jesus is saying here is saying, don't try to save your treasures in a treasure box here on earth. And the reason he gives is that the things of this world are perishable. Because if moths and rust can destroy them, what good are they? You know, I always use the example of the... Uh, Egyptian uh, pharaohs of old who used to store up gold and silver and all these treasures and then when they get buried they get buried with them they bury them with the gold with the silver but we know that that gold and silver was dug up later by uh, by thieves and <laughs> so 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 those things beloved you will leave here but the investments that we make in the kingdom of God, we will find on the other side when we receive our rewards and our crowns. Amen. Amen. So, in the book of Proverbs, there are a lot of ways and methods about how to be wise about our finances. There are a lot of financial practices and tips. So. I would like to encourage you, beloved, to read the book of Proverbs. And in particular, the part about leaving an inheritance for your children's children. You see, in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14, Paul uses the words, I'm going to paraphrase it, about how parents are to save up to help their children. Jesus himself and his disciples lived off the financial generosity of those who had accumulated some uh, wealth at the time. In uh, the book of Luke, chapter 12, verse 16, Jesus told the parable of a rich man whose land was so productive that he didn't even have any place to store all of his crops. So he said, I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool. This very night your soul is required of you. And now, who will own what you have prepared? Everything he had saved up was lost. That is how the world lives, beloved. They live as if they are going to live for a hundred years or more. But for us, beloved, we live 
by investing daily in the kingdom because we know that the time is short. Yeah. Amen. So, as Christians, we are to live differently. In summary, most people live for the things that they can see around them. But for us, we live by faith and not by sight. So, although we cannot drive the, the heavenly cars while we are here, and the mansions that are awaiting us when we reach heaven, we are not living in them now. But by faith, beloved, we must know that those things are there. Yeah. And we must continue to work diligently for the kingdom whilst we are here. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So, your investments reveal your heart in closing the Torah. Yeah. Yeah. And finally, that, that means that it doesn't matter if uh, we know the, 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 the parable about the woman who gave her last two shillings. Jesus said, it doesn't matter if you've got 20 million or 100 million and you give 1 million. It doesn't really demonstrate that your heart is more giving than the, the, the person who gives their last two coins. Yeah, yeah. Or dare I say, who even gives the button of their coat. Yeah, yeah. Amen? Amen. So it is an issue of the heart. And when we talk about uh, investing in the kingdom, Bazarani, as I said, it could be investing your time and your other resources. It's not only about financial investment. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So if your money reflects your heart, then what the question you should be asking is what does your bank statement say about your heart? Yeah. Oh my God. What does it say about where our hearts are? What does it say about our spending and whether Jesus is really the Lord and Savior in our lives? We should ponder on these things, beloved. What does your giving say about what you really believe about missions and evangelism? Yeah. Yes. What does the kind of treasure you are investing in say about how much you really believe in heaven and the rewards that are awaiting us in heaven? These are the questions I would really love to leave you with this morning, Mazarwan. And in conclusion, make every investment an investment to advance God's kingdom. It will be the best return you will ever receive. Yes. Yes. Don't leave this life and go, go to heaven empty-handed. Invest your life, invest your money, invest your time, in saving up treasures in heaven that can never be taken away. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I would like to invite the pastor, Bazalwane, to close for us. And uh, may we just pray, Bazalwane, that this word springs us into action. Yes. That this word shows us how urgent this is. Amen. You know, uh, I like what Ubusa was saying, that the kingdom of darkness is very brave. Mm. They are building big, beautiful buildings. They are well resourced. But all of those things will remain here. With us, beloved, whatever we do to invest in the kingdom of God is like a transaction. Yes. You know when you go overseas and you and you or you go to another country and you exchange your lands for, for, for Botswana Pula. It's that transaction. Yeah. When you invest in the kingdom of God, it's like a transaction. You are converting what you have here into your rewards in heaven. Yes. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. If the pastor could please come forward just to close for us and to thank the Lord for the words that we have received this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we're so grateful for this word. Thank you so much, O God, for speaking to us so succinctly so clearly and we acknowledge the agency and i pray father that it be not just the word that you are going to ponder on but may it be the word that you are going to act on in jesus mighty name father i believe you are speaking to us in various ways and some of us have to deal with certain issues in our finances oh god i pray for your paradigm shift in jesus name we have put too much trust in the babylonian system 
and we never thought that it would crumble one day. And I pray in Jesus' name that we may acknowledge, O oh God, that if there is anything that is guaranteed, it is your kingdom. Okay. And your word says, Blessed be the name of the Lord that we are inheriting a kingdom that shall not perish, a kingdom that shall not be consumed, the kingdom that is eternal. Lord, we bless your wonderful name for your kingdom. Amen and amen. amen. Hallelujah. That was a good word. Of course, I see a Maybe before you go, I just wanted to speak. Because this is a very important word. You know, I, I used to think of Koza just before the coming of the Lord. What I would do is I would just go around making loans, <laughs> borrow as much money as I can. And then the bankers would watch me as I'm raptured into the sky. <laughs> I don't know, just 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 to just to spite the system, you know? <laughs> but you touched on Romans chapter 13. Oh, no one anything Amen. except love. I mean, if you can just probably highlight the issue of us making debts again that we don't need. Uh, because I, I, I thought maybe these things don't matter once rapture takes place. But it does matter. Amen, Brother Nai. Thank you, Fundisi. The, the one thing uh, I didn't emphasize in the in the word or in the message is uh, that, first of all, not all debt is bad. Because if you, if, you, if you, for example, if you purchase land, it's appreciating. It's the issue of over-indebtedness that is the problem. And the definition of over-indebtedness is where you, you are sitting in a position where you are unable to pay the loan as and when it becomes due. And at the same time, you are sitting in a position where you also don't have anything to show for it. So in other words, if the bank loans you money and you are indebted and you go and you go on holiday and you come back, during the time of the Antichrist government, those debts are going to cost people a lot. For some people, it may even cost them their souls. That is why it is such an important topic, Bazalwan, that when we go into debt and we have to pay back, we must be able to incur debts that we can pay back. So that when the system collapses and these things happen, as we are seeing the trends and what's happening now, we are able to pay those debts and get out of the system. Otherwise, we will be dragged along with that system. I mean, uh, there's also another story for this way, where, where, where the, uh, the, the, the Pharisees approached Jesus and they said, what do you think about paying these taxes? And he said, show me that coin. And they gave him the coin and he turned it around and he said, whose imprint is this? And they said, it's Caesar. And he said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. But the important part about that scripture is he then says, give to God what belongs to God. So when we talk about being faithful, particularly with our tithes, the 10% belongs to God. We are simply returning back to Him what belongs to Him. Amen. Amen. So when you see, it's such an important topic to, to, to pay what you owe. Uh, it, it, is, it is such an, I, I can't tell you, in our industry, with COVID in particular, how many liquidations, sequestrations, it's devastating. When people lose everything, including the mattress that they are sleeping on. You know, when I started studying law, one of the things that you could not attach from someone is their mattress. I used to laugh during lectures because they used to say, you can attach everything, but you leave them with their mattress. Nowadays, there doesn't seem to be. <laughs> no, it's just it's quite interesting, beloved. And also, the Bible says you are a slave to the one you owe. So there is an element of spiritual slavery as well associated with indebtedness. So let's attend to that. And then last thing is uh, in addition to giving into the kingdom, another way you can actually store up treasure in heaven is giving to the poor. 
and, and maybe Dr. Pazif can just speak into that as well, because uh, many of us, again, you know, we live lives that are just so self-centered, you know, and we forget about what's happening around us, you know, and, and I do believe that uh, in this next phase, God is actually going to move us into a space where we are a blessing to, 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 to the poor. And uh, if you can just touch on that, because I'm, I'm, I'm remembering here, the young rich ruler is asked, uh, 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 he asked Jesus, how can I inherit the kingdom of heaven? Mm. And then Jesus says, you know, uh, do the commandments. Yeah. And he said, all of that I have done. Mm. But then, the money thing came. Amen. 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 Again, it's very such a, a, an important concept. You know, the Bible also says that uh, you, if you invite people into your home and you are generous, you may even invite angels without knowing. Yes. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So we need to pray, Brother Rani, to have that open heart to giving and to helping others. You know, we may not know, we may entertain angels yeah. without even knowing it. Yeah. Amen. But going back is to, to, to the point you made about the, the rich ruler, where the stumbling block for him was he was, he was happy to do all the commandments. What that represents is that... Including paying tithes. Oh, yes. He was, he was paying tithes. He was happy to pay tithes. Mm. So, so, so what that means is we are happy to come to church, we are happy to do the things that we do in our Christian walk and to pay tithes. But then when we are expected to lose everything in order to gain everything, because that's what the word says, that was the stumbling block for the young ruler. He was not prepared to lose everything that he had here. Amen. Amen. Uh, I also re remember when you see, as you were speaking, uh, you know, the Bible says it will be easier for the camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich person to get into heaven. Yes, yeah. That goes to show that money is really the root of all evil. Mm -hmm. The love of it. The love of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yeah. So the love of money or the obsession with more money and more money, which is what the world encourages us yeah. uh, uh, to do, is actually problematic because it may end up costing us our salvation yeah. if we are not careful. Amen. The, the interesting thing again with that uh, example of course was when Jesus says it's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven, it's easier for a camel to enter through the eye of the needle. I think we've explained this before that uh, the city gate was huge and there was a small opening in that city gate for people who would come in the evening because they will not open the whole gate. So there was a small aperture that was created for late camels. So if you came in a camel, if your camel was loaded, it could not negotiate its way through that aperture within the gate. And this is what the camel needed to do. It needed to offload and it needed to stoop. And then crawling, it will go through the eye of the needle because upright it could not. With luggage on its back, it could not. So it had to offload and then crawl its way through that small aperture in the gate. And Jesus is saying, listen, if you are loaded with money, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. You need to Amen. offload. And how do you offload? You give to the poor. You give to the poor. So now, Tubakosa's message today, he, I love the way you introduced the message. You spoke about the prophetic time we're in. I do believe that we need to pray for prophetic wisdom. What hour are we in? Here's a practical example. If I die a billionaire, I leave billions in the bank for the Antichrist. Those billions will not serve anyone. But if I pray for prophetic wisdom and say, Father, help me to dispatch this money. Help me to use this money. There is a book, a powerful book that was written. Uh, the, the title of the book is Die Broke. Die Broke. Because the chances are when you are dead, people are going to be fighting over your money. 
the government will take over your estate if you did not draw a will. And your, those riches will not serve anyone. But if you start saying, Father, as I live right now, as I continue to live, help me to distribute these resources wisely. That's a better way of living. Amen. So maybe let us start making those prayers. And this is a serious thing because, because I recall that Ananias and Sapphira died because of these issues. When they could not distribute what was entrusted with, uh, to them and, and the way God, had, what God wanted them to. How much time do you think we have? Um, because now you spoke about coming out of the banking system. That's one of the questions that's going through our heads. And I know it's an unfair question. But if someone, for example, if someone is seated here and they have two million in the bank, how much time do I have before I start distributing that two million wisely out of the collapsing banking system? By the way, this is a very important situation. In 2009, when there was an economic meltdown, people could not access their monies in the bank because those monies had to bail out government. Now, what's, what's your sense, of course, about people, all of us seated here, I'm sure we have bank accounts and some have millions that they don't want to tell us about. Uh, what do we do with that? Amen, uh, I don't know about the time period or the time frame. Nobody knows. But I can tell you it's very urgent. I mentioned the speech by one of the members of the British royal family who was talking about somebody that he did not identify who has trillions of dollars more than any government and all the world governments put together. It is so imminent. In fact, one of the things I, I also picked up when I was just doing some research is that a lot of the governments in the world are selling off their gold reserves. You know, governments hold on to foreign currency and gold. Because when, when, things, when things collapse, if you think about what happened in Libya with uh, what was his name? Uh, oh Gaddafi. Gaddafi. The first thing that happened was when they killed Gaddafi, his son took his bodyguards and he ran to the reserve bank to take the gold. So when they went to the reserve bank, the gold was gone. That is the only thing Gaddafi's son left with. Because he knows that that is the one thing that has value. When a currency collapses and an economy collapses, Look at Afghanistan now. If you went there with gold, you would become a billionaire overnight because those currencies and those economies collapse. And when they collapse, the money that you have is not worth the paper it's written on. You can tear it up or put it in a fire. So we must not put all our trust in the system, but at the same time, for this, I think we must start thinking. I, I showed what's happening. Bill Gates is the third richest person in the world and he's investing in farmland, of all things. He's never been a farmer. That should tell you something about food security. So that becomes, for me, the one thing is, is to say, if people can think about how, even if, if, you can, if you can get off the grid, if you can afford to, by all means, you know, have a Jojo tank and live off the grid. You know, there are communities that are already living off the grid, and some of them not by choice. But the point of the matter is the more independent we are of the system, the better the chances we will have to exist outside the system. You know, I was watching a, a video in Austria, by the way, is the first country in the world that has put in a mandatory vaccination policy whereby the unvaccinated cannot leave their homes. So I was watching this documentary. This guy was a journalist. He was going around speaking to the people who were vaccinated, who were walking around. And then he was going into the homes of those people who were unvaccinated. And he said, how do you guys live? Because you are treated as lepers. You, you, are, you are locked in your homes. And one of the ladies was saying, actually, we are coexisting. We, we are sharing recipes on how to make home, home baked bread. We are, we are now having to find alternatives. There's a little ecosystem that we have created. It reminds me of the riots and the, and the looting in July. Do you remember the four days where we, we couldn't go to the shops? Some of the, some of the people, I mean, I remember my wife 
was budget changing. You know, if somebody had paid 